Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Come and get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying encounters. I post new videos every day, so be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell, and you'll be notified when new daily content arrives on my channel. All right, let's get right into it. I was nine years old and living in North Fort Myers, Lee County in Florida. In the weeks before this happened to me, there were several sightings of Bigfoot reported in the newspaper. One of the sightings had taken place in the wooded area not far from where I lived. Our house was on the corner of a state drive and another street I can't remember near a canal. We lived a block from the US 41 on the corner with a street light that usually lit up my bedroom, which I shared with my younger sister and my grandmother. It was around 10 p.m. and I was in bed trying to go to sleep. I was startled by some heavy footstep outside on the grass and as I turned to the window, I saw a huge shadow pass by as I continued hearing the footsteps. Whatever it was walked right past my window with a human-like walk. I couldn't make out what it was, but it was not any four-legged animal such as a cow. This thing walked on two feet and was taller than a man. Then I heard a low-pitched but quite loud moan that just scared the heck out of me. I was not asleep, as my parents later asked, because I sat up straight in bed and seeing that my sister and grandma were sound asleep. I ran out of my room and jumped into bed with my mother and father, sobbing and shaking. I know that I heard and saw a Bigfoot shadow. I had never before, nor never after, had an experience like that one. I will never forget it. At school, when I mentioned what had happened, several kids had stories of sightings, but of course, kids will make stuff up like that. There were several sightings in the Fort Myers area. They should be in the newspapers. The incident occurred at around 10 p.m. It was semi-dark in my room, but the streetlight was shining in from the corner. I can't remember the weather. It was in the suburb, but Near us, there was an extensive wooded area, and there were canals everywhere. On to the next one. In Alucha County in Florida. My sighting was 41 years ago, in Gainesville, Florida. Back then, it was mostly woods, and I was going to see a neighbor at a slow jog. I looked to my right, and we were both surprised. He was what I figured to be, seven foot six inches. He had big, dark, round eyes, lots of hair, and just stared at me till I took off. There was no sound. He didn't come after me. He just stared. I know it was a long time ago, but I did see a Sasquatch. The next night, my mom came out of her room screaming that someone was looking in her window. That's why I thought he or she must be seven foot tall or so. Our windows were very high. It was at 7 p.m., it was dark weather, and it was warm. There were lots of woods. Glen Springs is nearby, as well as Hogtown Creek. On to the next one. At Brooksville, in Bedford County in Florida, near Wikiwachi Springs, in September, Miss Eula Lewis, had just gone through her back door when she heard a heavy rustling noise to the west of her. Eula then saw the outline of a round head and shoulders and she moved back towards the back door as the hairy humanoid moved towards her with loud thudding footsteps. The creature had an extremely fast lope and was very hairy. The next morning she found three humanoid footprints that were not made by a bear there were also many individual witnesses in the area of a six-foot-plus hairy humanoid that weighed a minimum of 300 pounds. The creature made shrill, unearthly calls and upset garbage cans. On to the next one. In Brooksville, the following month in October, 
a tall, hairy humanoid was sighted repeatedly in the area by many witnesses. The creature left humanoid footprints that were not human, though, but not ape or bear either. Occasionally, it disturbed garbage men. The man-beast was over six feet tall and weighed 300 to 400 pounds and sometimes made a shrill cry. For the same period that the Bigfoot was seen, a huge UFO was seen in the sky as well. On to the next one. At Elfers, near the Anclote River in Pasco County in Florida, Ralph Bud Chambers, in his early 20s, was walking in the woods when he saw something big to the side of him standing in the trees. There was a harsh coughing sound and he went to get his rifle and a friend. They came back and found large footprints. There was also a vile smell, a rancid odor like stale urine. They tracked the monster and called the sheriff who sent two officers. Both smelt it, but they could not catch it. Chambers hunting dogs refused to follow the tracks and were frightened. They found finger-like markings on the riverbank where it had slid into the river. There were four distinct finger marks, but no thumb. As for the big feet and Sasquatches, they are literally everywhere. On to the next one. In Brooksville on November, a girl changing a flat tire on her car heard a strange noise in the bushes and smelled a most unpleasant smell. Then she noticed a huge thing standing on the side of the road. The creature had green eyes and a greenish glow to one side of its torso. It was watching her, but seemed more interested in the tire changing operation than in the witness though. It then vanished into the wood. It was not a bear, and it was hairy all over. On to the next one. At Alexander Springs in Marion County in Florida, in the Ocala National Forest, Nancy Leitner and Pamela Ann Nader went up the nature trail. It was too cold for swimming, they had decided, and they went for a walk instead. They were never seen again, and no traces were ever found of them. During the same time, there were several hairy humanoid sightings around here. Is there a connection? Or were there several types of monsters at large, including the human one? On to the next one. I'm going to tell you a story that came down in my family through, let's see, my dad, his dad, and his dad, including me, that makes four generations. This happened to my great-grandparents. This happened in 1910, and my great-grandparents were both in their early 30s. It was just before my grandpa was born. Anyway, my great-grandparents, Robert and Rebecca O'Reilly, were some of the early pioneers in British Columbia. They came west from Ireland via Quebec, then made their way through the Canadian Prairie Provinces and on through Calgary, what there was of it, and then onto the Okanagan Valley, a very good place for growing fruit and produce. It's actually called Canada's Banana Belt, and the fact that the climate is more moderate than in most of Canada is probably the only reason they survived their first hard years. Fruit orchards are the major crop in the Okanagan country, which stretches clear down into the United States. Wine grapes are now a big crop, but I'm sure that my great-grandparents wouldn't have been shocked to see that. They were teetotalers and wouldn't touch alcohol in any form. That's a tradition that died out in my family, fortunately, and we all now enjoy a good glass of wine. Heck, we actually have a winery and make our own. Where they lived became part of what's called the Fruit Highway. They eventually settled in a little town called Summerland over on the west side of Okanagan Lake. But I was told this event happened over by Cherryville, further east and in the foothills of the Monashi Mountains. How they ended up in BC in the first place is unknown to me. They were in their first year of homesteading a place and it had been a hard go. And by the way, 
one can still homestead in some parts of Canada, like Alberta. My great-grandparents had barely grown enough food to make it through their first winter, mostly canned berries and some root foods like potatoes. Most of their foodstuff was stored in a root cellar on their farm. Like most settlers, their main food supply was wild meat, like venison, which they dried and smoked, then hung in the root cellar or canned. They lived in a small cabin and the cellar was next door, half buried in the ground with some rough stairs going down into it. These old root cellars did a good job of storing things as being mostly underground. They moderated the temperatures to where things were kept cool but not freezing. Things like apples would store perfectly all winter. British Columbia can have some brutal winters, but the Okanagan is known for being less severe, even somewhat moderate. But back in the early 1900, things there were still very cold, even in the Okanagan. Scientists say the Little Ice Age ended pretty much in 1850, but the climate was still very severe in much of the North for some time after that. Apparently, my great-grandmother kept a journal, and the year this happened in 1910, she talked about day after day of sub-zero weather and snow so deep they had to dig tunnels five or six feet deep to get from the house to the cellar and the barn. This story is all from my great-grandmother's journal. Fortunately, they had only two horses to feed as a lot of the farmers lost their stock that year from the severe blizzard. This was the same year of the Rogers Pass avalanche in the Selkirk Mountains of BC, which killed 62 train workers, as well as the avalanche at Stevens Pass in Washington, which killed 96. According to my great-grandmother's diary, winter hit hard and fast that year, with barely an autumn to speak of. She wrote of how happy she was that my great-grandpa had managed to shoot an extra deer that year, one more than they'd had the previous winter, which had been a tough and go season from a survival standpoint. She had also learned to make pemmican from a local native, which is a high-energy mixture of meat and fat and berries. It was a staple of natives and trappers, though most of them were gone from the area by then. Pemmican is made by cutting the leanest portions of meat into thin strips and then drying it over a fire. After it's dried, it's pounded into a powder, then melted together with fat and berries and made into balls, which are then stored, usually in leather bags. Pemmican is famous for keeping well, supposedly even for decades, and can be eaten as is or fried. It's a very high energy food, and a couple of backpacking food companies make energy bars that are pretty close to pemmican. Tanka bars and epic bars are some examples. Anyway, pemmican was responsible for me being around today to tell this story as my great-grandmother had made and stored a good amount of it in the back bedroom of their cabin, hanging it from the rafters. After the incident I'm about to relate, it was all the food they had left, but enough to get them out of there. I've thought about this story a lot, and it seems to me that what happened probably actually saved their lives as it forced them to leave before winter got too severe and the snows were too deep they couldn't leave and would be stuck there. It was a harsh winter, a winter many didn't survive, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Like I said, winter hit hard and fast. There wasn't much to do each day, well, except to keep the fire going, which meant gathering wood and it wasn't long before they needed snowshoes to even get around, although they had a big supply they'd gathered over the summer. And did I mention getting water from a nearby stream? Also, there was feeding the horses, putting them out so they could get water from the stream. They had to be kept in the barn at night because of the wolves, and all of the other things that go with trying to survive in the winter in British Columbia in what was probably a not very well insulated cabin. It was a harsh life, but at least there weren't any brown bears around to worry about, as they had the sense to hibernate. I'm just going to start calling them Grams and Gramps, okay? <laughs> it's too hard to say all the greats stuff. Well, one night, they heard a strange moaning coming from the direction of the barn. Gramps was worried it was wolves trying to get in to where the horses were, but Gram said no, it couldn't be wolves, 
It didn't sound anything at all like wolves to her. They lay there in bed, speculating as to what it could be when Gramps finally decided to go check it out. Gramps was worried it was some of the native people coming to steal their food or horses, but Gramps said that was ridiculous as they sure as heck wouldn't be moaning and waking everyone up. Now, lots of folks back then were very superstitious as they didn't have the knowledge to explain things like we do now, so they just winged it. So Gramps decided it had to be some kind of spirit and forbade Gramps from leaving the cabin. Probably a good thing considering what they found the next morning. Something had tried to get into the cellar. There were big scratch marks all up and down the door and Gramps found what looked like very large footprints, but they were pretty indistinct due to the fact that it had snowed some more during the night, partially covering them. This was a puzzler as the tracks were big like a brown bear would leave, but it was far too cold for bears to be awake. Gramps figured it was a bear whose hibernation instincts had gone haywire, but Gramps was suspecting one of the natives. The problem with her theory is that most of the natives had migrated out of the mountains and into the milder coastal regions for the winter. Besides, the few who were around knew Gramps would feed them if needed. Why bother to try to steal food when it could be freely obtained? Besides, she was a friend as she always helped anyone in need. Okay, the next night, they heard the same moaning sound, but this time, Dawn showed the root cellar had been broken into, and whoever did it had hands, because the doors had been levered open, and on top of that, about a third of the canning jars had their lids wrenched off and were empty. Someone had stolen lots of canned fruit and meat, as well as canned potatoes and beans, and even some peppers, and whoever it was, they were barefoot and had huge feet according to the tracks left in the snow. Now, Gramps and Gramps were very upset. It had to be one of the natives, or possibly one of the crusty miners that made up most of the population of what was Cherryville at the time. But why remove the food from the jars and not just steal the jars themselves? Maybe they were carrying the food in some kind of packs is what Gramps thought, but Gramps said that didn't make any sense especially since it would all be mushed together. Gramps had no idea what to do at this point, and all their winter supplies, except the horse's hay and the pemmican in the cabin, were in the root cellar. They would die if any more of their food were stolen. In fact, just losing what they had so far now made getting through the winter an iffy proposition, even with the pemmican. Gramps decided he would have to stand guard over the root cellar and catch whoever was stealing their food. There was no other way, as they couldn't risk losing any more supplies. But it was just too darn cold to hang around all night, hoping he would catch the thief. And what then? There was no court of law or anything he could do with whoever it was, just warn them off. Gramps was a pretty inventive guy, and what he did was chisel out enough chinking in the cabin wall that he could see outside right to the root cellar. Then, during the day, they could stuff a gunny sack in it to keep the cold out. It was a peephole, and Gramps set himself up all comfortable where he could see out and begin his vigil that very night. He also put an old board across the root cellar door, nailing it in place as an extra deterrent on top of the latch. The cellar still held lots of canned goods, as well as the dried meat of two large deer and a beef Gramps had traded a fellow who wanted some wooden tools Gramps had carved. Gramps dutifully sat there all night, but finally, in the early hours of the morning, his vision was blocked by snow. Another blizzard had come in, and it was a total whiteout. Before winter had hit, Gramps had tied several ropes together and hung them from the posts in the ground to guide him out to the barn to feed the horses, a sort of rope fence going from the barn to the house. He'd done this after hearing a neighbor had frozen to death the previous winter, a mere 20 feet from his house in a blizzard, not realizing where he was. Gramps went out and fed the horses, worried about them getting lost in the blizzard, so he kept them in. Surely it would clear off before long, and he could let them out for a drink of water. He hadn't made a rope path to the root cellar, just the barn, so he didn't go out that day to check things out as they had food in the cabin. The blizzard finally lifted that late afternoon and he was able to water the horses, then put them right back into the barn. By evening, the sky had cleared, 
and it was bitter cold, the frozen snow cracking under his feet. He finally managed to dig a path to the root cellar in the fresh snow, and what he then saw made his hair stand on end. The door had been completely lifted off its hinges and thrown a good 20 feet into a snowbank. Looking inside, he could see that the place had literally been cleaned out. Everything was gone except broken glass jars, and even the venison and beef that had been hanging from the rafters was gone. Whoever had taken the food had to be very strong, or else they just made a number of trips and all during a raging blizzard. He stumbled back inside the cabin, speechless. Finally, Grams went outside to look for herself, and when she returned, she was also speechless. They both felt like they just received a death sentence, and the logistics of it seemed impossible. How could someone make off with so much food, and in a raging blizzard no less, and who was strong enough to actually lift a heavy wooden door off its hinges and throw it that far? They tried to sleep that night, but all they could do was talk about what it could be, and they both knew the answer. Sasquatch. Only a Sasquatch could do something like that, and hadn't there been plenty of talk about them ever since they'd come into this country? They'd been warned off by the natives, but they'd laughed, thinking it was just a legend. I believe from the stories I've heard, that Sasquatch was once much more plentiful in Canada, at least that part of the country in the Okanagan Valley and Monashi Mountains. The native people seemed to have made a sort of truth with them, and they even revered them. But the white settlers began the big push to civilize everything. And it's my opinion that the Sasquatch moved to the more remote areas. That's just my thoughts on it. Well, the next day, Rams and Gramps hitched up the horses to the wagon after putting on the sleigh rails, loaded up enough hay to feed the horses until they could get to the next settlement, added whatever they could fit of their personal things and along with all the pemmican headed out. According to Graham's journal, the going was rough, the snow was deep, and the horses really struggled. And she and Gramps ended up walking most of the way, their feet wet and cold. Their first night out, they slept under the wagon on a big moose pelt that kept out the snow. Grams wrote that they heard the same howling they had heard at the cabin, but Gramps immediately shot off a couple of rounds from his rifle, and the creature left them alone. They were deathly afraid of it, stealing their pemmican or even their horses. They eventually made it to some settlement. I'm not sure where it was, but they spent the rest of the winter in a shared cabin with a couple of miners there. They ate on that pemmican the rest of the winter, and Gramps was able to trade some of it for some flour and sugar and that kind of thing. The next spring, they moved further into the valley, where they settled in the small settlement of Summerland. They eventually somehow acquired a piece of land where they started an orchard and built a house far from the mountains where the Sasquatch roamed. My family managed to hold on to the property they settled, and it's now owned by my brother and I. We have a beautiful vineyard and winery. There, along what's called Bottleneck Drive, a system of roads that connects the wineries, the land here is very fertile, and we grow some of the world's most flavorful grapes. So, I really do believe that I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for a Sasquatch who forced my great-grandparents to move to a more habitable area. We feel very fortunate to live where we do, in one of the world's most beautiful places. We've worked hard here on this wonderful land they left us. So, in honor of that Sasquatch who saved my great-grandparents' lives, we decided to make a very tasty red wine called Sasquatch Skedaddle. It's aged quite well and is full-bodied and robust, just like a Sasquatch. Come on by sometime and I'll pour you a glass. I hope you enjoyed those encounters, and if you did, be sure to hit that like button, leave a comment, and subscribe. I post new content every single day, so be sure to hit that notification bell, and you'll be notified exactly when that new content arrives on my channel. Again, thank you so much, and until next time, bye!